Okay, good morning. Welcome everyone. I am showing 1030. So we'll go ahead and get started and folks can trickle in um, throughout today's session and we are recording. So I, we do have some folks who expressed an interest in the recording. Uh, my name is Hannah Scott. I'm the program director for the Center for Cooperatives in the College of Food, Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at Ohio State University. And we're excited you've joined us today for an online session of the Appalachia Cooperates Initiative. So we do have just a couple of housekeeping items before we jump in. Um, participants can ask questions really throughout the session. Uh, we'd like this to be a dialogue based session. Uh, so feel free to use the chat function on your Zoom toolbar to do that. We're also hopefully going to share some resources and we'll use the chat function to do that as well. So keep an eye on that. Uh, throughout the conversation. As I said, we are planning to record and we'll make that recording available online. We do have a, a kind of landing page for the Appalachia Cooperates Initiative. That's at go.osu.edu slash Appalachia Cooperates. You can actually find recordings from a number of past sessions there. So topics from cooperating for sustainable development to um, cooperative broadband initiatives in Central Appalachia to thinking about worker ownership uh, cooperatives as a transition strategy for uh, existing businesses. So lots of resources available there and this video will be housed there as well. Do give us some time to edit and to make that available. Uh, at the end of today's session, you're gonna be redirected to an evaluation. Your feedback helps us improve future learning opportunities, and we do appreciate your responses. And then um, my disclaimer for the day, you'll see this another time, but uh, today's session is educational only, and it does not constitute legal advice. And I'm sure John is going to have that disclaimer as well. So um, a little bit about the Center for Cooperatives. Uh, we provide education, training, and technical assistance on the cooperative business model really across the region. So. Uh, in Ohio and West Virginia, and then we provide uh, education and training services via the Mid-America Cooperative Council as well across the region. And as a part of that work, we convene a special program that we call the Appalachia Cooperates Initiative, which really is a, a learning network. So we view this as an opportunity to connect co-op, community, business, economic development, and other advocates in our region and really the goal is to contribute to the development of a thriving co-op ecosystem in Central Appalachia. And to do that through uh, building awareness around the co-op business model, uh, equipping practitioners with skills and knowledge to help uh, contribute to that ecosystem, and then facilitating a network of connected developers, whether those are co-op developers, community developers, business developers, and we just want to recognize that this uh, initiative was really born out of a collaborative dialogue between partners in Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. And we, we uh, thank those partners for their engagement. Um, so to kick things off, we'd like to get to know who's on the session just to help tailor some of our conversations. So we have a quick poll here if you're able to participate in that to just share with us the role that best describes your connection to the co-op uh, community. So um, thinking about whether uh, you'd best be described as a co-op member, employee or leader, an, an economic development professional, a co-op developer, an educator, or something else. So we'll give just a few minutes to participate in that and uh, everybody's welcome to participate. And it looks like Okay, so a number of educators or um, government professionals, extension, um, and then some economic development professionals. So John, hopefully that helps tailor the conversation a little bit for you. Uh, and we can um, connect, connect better with one another. So today we're really excited to explore the topic of, oh, here's my, my disclaimer one more time, education only. Uh, today we're really excited to explore the topic legal frameworks for co-ops in West Virginia. So co-ops like other business entities are formed under state laws and the United States has actually a pretty diverse array of state statutes for cooperatives. So there are statutes focused on specific types of co-ops like broadband co-ops or worker co-ops or agricultural co-ops. Uh, there are statutes that allow for things like non-member investment that some folks might think of as 
quote, non-traditional, uh, and, and many more variations. So for practitioners, entrepreneurs, co-op developers, uh, really this diversity can sometimes create complexity or sometimes even confusion. So today we're really excited that John has joined us to dive into the cooperative frame frameworks that are specific to West Virginia. Uh, John's an attorney and the program director of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Law Clinic at the West Virginia University College of Law. And I'll ask John to introduce himself a little bit further and then to jump right into today's content. Thanks, John, for being here. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, excuse me all if I sound a little bit nasally. This is my first day back in the office after, uh, after having COVID. So let me... We're glad you're back <clears throat> and... Uh, back Would you want me to share the screen or are you? You should be able to do that now. Everyone see that? Yep, looks great to me. All right, wonderful. Yes, so um, as Hannah said, for, first, real quick, uh, just because we have a small group, uh, feel free to jump in, interrupt me, um, ask for clarification. Uh, uh, ask any questions that you might need. I tend to talk fast. Um, there's a lot to kind of go over in the cooperative realm in West Virginia. Um, so this, this is by far not going to be an all-encompassing uh, presentation. Um, but real quick, um, my name is John. Um, I'm the program director of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Law Clinic uh, at the West Virginia College of Law. Um, I'm going to, to speak to you a little bit about agricultural cooperatives in West Virginia. Um, and as we have only a limited amount of time, I will just be providing like an overview of the cooperative model, um, the formation process, uh, and some pertinent laws that, that may be relevant um, that you should be aware of. And then uh, obviously answering any questions that you may have. Um, as a lawyer, uh, and as Hannah mentioned, I do have to, to, to reiterate that this is only for educational purposes. Um, and if you do have a specific question in regards to uh, a cooperative that you're involved in or that you own, um, that you definitely seek assistance from an attorney. Um, that being said, um, I'm going to quickly go over a little bit about our clinic um, and the services that we provide. There we go. Um, as I said, I direct the, the entrepreneurship clinic here at the, the College of Law. Uh, the EILC is a transactional law clinic. It provides free legal services to organizations based in West Virginia. Um, we are the only clinic in West Virginia that provides uh, legal services to small businesses, nonprofits, and cooperatives um, throughout West Virginia. Uh, the goal of our clinic is to spur economic, economic development within our state. Uh, we have an emphasis on role owned businesses and minority owned businesses. Um, additionally, as a legal clinic, uh, we, we are act as an outlet for third year law students um, to gain practical experience. And uh, what I mean by that is essentially the same thing that you would think of if you um, uh, uh, think of a doctor doing a residency. Um, third year law students will practice under the supervision of myself or another attorney and essentially represent you uh, throughout the process or represent clients throughout the process of formation um, uh, or any transactional assistance that they may need. Um, as a transactional law clinic, uh, uh, we do not rep represent clients in any forms of litigation. Um, so if and additionally, we will not represent clients in, if there's a potential for litigation. So if you come to our clinic and you are seeking uh, assistance with uh, obtaining a trademark and we think that your name is very similar to another organization's name, we likely will not uh, uh, file that trademark because there's that potential for litigation. Uh, along those lines, we, we will not assist in negotiation. So when we kind of start talking about members and membership agreements, uh, uh, you may have to seek independent counsel to kind of negotiate those agreements. Um, we assist clients in all their internal and external formation requirements, uh, uh, regulatory advisement, like I said, intellectual property, employment matters, um, and really anything that you can think of that a small business or nonprofit may need uh, internally or externally. Um, 
at the end of the presentation, I'll have my website listed where you can apply or you can send people to apply along with my contact information if you have any additional questions about this presentation or just need uh, uh, to, to talk about any questions that you might not have or that I might not have covered um, or that if you need any assistance with any of the applications. Additionally, I sent Anna and uh, Samantha my slides um, so those will be available as well if you need to um, review them or obviously she said that she's recording this, um, you can look back and uh, review the presentation. But with that said, does anybody have any questions about my clinic, myself, um, the process for applying before I dive into the, the meat of the presentation? No? Awesome. And I will have to pause to drink. <laughs> um, I tell my students when we're going over, and we'll talk about this a little bit, when I go over bylaws, or operating agreements, or anything like that with a client, it's not unusual for me to sit there and just ramp for an hour and a half. And I, I wonder if anybody's ever listening, <laughs> but I get into my own head. Uh, but with that said, um, let's discuss cooperative. In West Virginia, there are um, two different types of privately owned cooperative models. Um, there are agricultural cooperatives and most recently broadband cooperatives. Uh, broadband cooperatives are a relatively new model focusing primarily on providing internet services throughout the state. Because of the limited time and um, uh, uh, essentially the, the, the the area of law, I will only be speaking of agricultural cooperatives today. Um, if you have a broadband cooperative question, I wrote essentially a guide on broadband cooperatives. So you can feel free to reach out to me and we can discuss that. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, I will only be covering agricultural cooperatives. So what is an agricultural cooperative and why would you want to start a co-op? Uh, versus another entity form such as a corporation or a limited liability company. Um, <clears throat> an agricultural cooperative is a type of business, whether organized for profit or nonprofit, in which individuals or businesses pool re their resources together in order to accomplish certain goals or provide protections to its members. Um, this is extremely prevalent uh, in rural communities with uh, 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 farmers co-ops um, who form, they, who, because they want to maybe diversify their um, offerings or meet certain demand requirements or obtain larger contractual agreements or larger loans. Um, and, and, and the members of an agricultural cooperative uh, will not only pool their resources together, but they will share in the profits and the losses of the organization. And this is utilized through a system called patronage that we'll talk a little bit about um, later in the presentation. And I will not be doing a deep dive into a lot of things. So oh, I feel there will be a lot of questions about patronage um, because that's what I find to be the most confusing uh, when you're looking at a cooperative model. But for now, just think of it as an alternative to the typical uh, shareholder distribution system that you would see in say a corporation. Um, where in a corporation, shareholders are issued dividends based on the amount of stock they own in the company. Uh, so for instance, I own 30% of a company in stock, I will get 30% of the profits or the distributions or dividends that are issued. Um, in cooperatives, it's much different. Patrons or members in a cooperative earn income based on the amount of goods or services or contributions they have uh, provided to the cooperative. And we'll get a little bit more into that later. Um, and I'm gonna try to maintain my time, Hannah. Just so if I am getting short on time, uh, uh, just let me know. I don't wanna, I do want to leave room for questions. Absolutely, we'll keep you in line on time. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, the major benefit of the cooperative model, at least in my opinion, is the pooling of resources, but also the ability for members to exist autonomously. And uh, what do I mean by that? Um, what I mean is that cooperatives allow for independent partner uh, farmers or companies to exist outside of the strength constraints of the cooperative um, or the corporation. Uh, for example, Farmer John, uh, I own a farm. Um, I sell goods, I conduct business ventures, and I have the ability, but I also have the ability to be a member of the cooperative. Um, 
uh, uh, I may share resources, I may share equipment. Um, I, like I said, I have the ability to gain larger contracts or apply for larger loans, but I also have that ability to enter into agreements that might not necessarily involve the cooperative. Um, whereas in a corporation, all agreements and all ownership is flowed through the same entity. Um, yeah, so another thing, uh, uh, in regards to um, benefits for cooperatives is they may obtain uh, beneficial tax treatment. And we'll discuss a little bit of the various taxation advantage, uh, advantages later. Um, but for right now, I just kind of want to mention that. Also cooperatives help support their community by providing a, uh, uh, that's probably popping up there, um, <clears throat> by providing uh, uh, a sustainable organization within the community. This is a major issue in West Virginia. Um, uh, in a corporation, corporation or a limited liability company, if someone moves or if uh, an owner decides that it's just not working out, they can move the corporation out of the area. A lot less likely for that to happen in an agricultural cooperative. Um, finally, cooperatives can engage in political activity uh, and lobbying. Uh, this has recently occurred a great deal in the hemp and medical marijuana industry. Um, the development of broadband cooperatives, like I mentioned before, here in West Virginia was a direct result of this kind of political activity um, uh, that has spurred across the United States. Any questions before I move forward? Awesome. There we go. All right, <clears throat> let's get into the boring kind of legal area where I start talking about the code. <laughs> um, so uh, I kind of want to talk about the, the um, cooperative statute and some of the requirements. Um, ag agricultural cooperatives in West Virginia are governed under Chapter 9, uh, Article 4 of the West Virginia Code. Uh, Section 2 states that ag co-ops may be organized uh, by three or more qualified persons engaged in the production of agricultural products or the provision of goods and services um, may form a cooperative association with or without capital stock. And uh, for those who haven't attended law school, I'm, I'm going to go through a little parsing of this code section here because it really outlines um, uh, how the organization is set up, some of the requirements that will be needed to, uh, the, to be placed into the articles, um, as well as uh, the, the bylaws or membership agreements of the organization. Um, so you may be asking yourself, uh, uh, three or more qualified persons, what does that mean? Um, so luckily we, we have the code defines qualified persons and you'll see this in West Virginia all the time that um, we do not usually do that. Uh, but uh, uh, luckily the, the code does uh, uh, define qualified persons. Um, so what is a qualified person? Uh, that the, the code states that a qualified person means a person who is engaged in producing, preserving, harvesting, drying, processing, manufacturing, canning, packing, grading, storing, handling, um, utilizing, marketing, financing, selling, distributing, shipping, blah, 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 procuring and providing, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, uh, other goods or services and products there, uh, right? So they basically try to cover everything um, that, that has to do with agriculture. Um, however, some notable organizations that could be argued to be excluded from the definition um, our restaurants, uh, which is debatable, may actually qualify if you look at it uh, that way, um, as well as say landowners who lease uh, uh, the farming area um, may not actually qualify because they are not uh, producing or um, engaging in that kind of, uh, of at development of agricultural products. Um, Another issue with this definition is whether a qualified person can be an organization or an individual. Um, <clears throat> the definition clearly states that a person, uh, it or clearly states a person, um, but does not define whether a person can be a company. In practice and 
after reviewing other provisions of the code and, 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 and looking at other, you know, the intent of legislation, I would, um, I think it's clear that a qualified person can be an organization, it does not necessarily have to be uh, an individual. It makes it easier for filing, um, but it can be an organization. Now, I will say with that organization, it will have to be um, on all of these documents put forward, it would have to be a um, authorized representative will be listed for that organization. So um, to avoid any kind of uh, uh, avoidance of liability or anything along those lines. Um, another question that you may have uh, is, um, what is exactly an agricultural product? Uh, the code defines agricultural products as well as any horticultural, viticultural, and I didn't know what viticultural was when I re-looked at this, and it's, it's the development of wine. Um, so we got to make sure we do. Uh, forestry, dairy, livestock, poultry, bee, and any farm products in their natural form or process. I do want to mention this does not necessarily include hemp or marijuana, uh, but uh, because this is a hot button topic. However, this is something I know for a fact is an agricultural product. I've worked with clients in the past on this and uh, uh, to form hemp based cooperative. Um, <clears throat> as always, though, remember that you know there are federal uh, legalities surrounding a lot of that. So um, don't just go out there and start growing uh, hemp or marijuana. Uh, there's a lot of restrictions and regulatory requirements <clears throat> that you need to be aware of. Um, also, this uh, definition doesn't necessarily include, say, something like purified water, right? Uh, not necessarily an agricultural product. And I, I, you know, I come up with these examples, but you'd be surprised. Um, a lot of the times, I'll, I'll see uh, 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 clients that do not have a straightforward agricultural product, or um, are not necessarily a qualified person. Uh, uh, and that's the first step, as always. So. Hopefully you are um, out there just growing corn, <laughs> but sometimes, you know, uh, um, that may not be the case. <clears throat> um, finally, what does the statute mean by uh, with or without capital stock? This is essentially the distinction between a for-profit agricultural cooperative and a non-profit agricultural cooperative. And we'll talk a little bit about those um, in just a second uh, um, and, and, and why capital stock is, is essentially different than patronage. All right. So any questions about that before I do my little slide? I also developed these slides and showed my wife them before, and you will see a fun slide later. And she said that I needed to include a fun slide because my slides were boring. Um, so I did try to make animations, um, but, um, in the interest of time, uh, I will kind of go over some of the, the nonprofit um, uh, uh, or distinctions surrounding a nonprofit cooperative. Um, but I'm not going to dive deep into that because that can be its own uh, uh, presentation. And you'll see that a lot, a lot of these topics can be their own presentation, or <laughs> essentially, this could be a whole uh, uh, course or multiple courses. <laughs> so, um, there, there, you know, this is a, a, a general overview. Um, <clears throat> but yes, so agricultural cooperatives can be a typical uh, 501c3. You don't see it <clears throat> as much um, just because of the nature of the cooperative model, but it is important to note that uh, <clears throat> they can be granted tax exemption uh, from in income taxation under uh, the Internal Revenue Code, Section 501c3. Um, this is, if for those who don't know, uh, 501c3 organizations are your typical nonprofit organizations that you think of. When you think of nonprofits, you think of uh, 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 organizations that can donate <clears throat> or receive donates that are donations that are uh, tax exempt from income taxation, but also the donors are able to write off those donations. Um, which is the most beneficial. This is what I consider a true nonprofit in the sense of nonprofit uh, organizations. But this may only happen if the organization is completely organized for some qualifying purpose <clears throat> and meets strict requirements of a 501c3, uh, such as 
allocating all or, or allocating most or excuse me, allocating all of their uh, profit for that qualifying purpose, um, rather than providing any income to its members. I will say that I've gotten around that um, with farmers markets before, uh, just because they were not necessarily um, utilizing income for or uh, bringing any donations to the members, but the members were making money. So an agricultural cooperative could theoretically make money for its members, but less likely to do it in a typical patronage sense. It would have to be structured slightly different. <clears throat> um, but I'll give some examples. Uh, uh, for example, an organization may be a group of farmers engaged in the resource and production of seeds uh, for some scientific or beneficial purpose um, that would meet you know, the specific um, or the strict requirements for 501c3 organizations. Um, and then, or an organization may be formed uh, to educate individuals on how to grow, on how to uh, 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 manufacture certain products, but then they utilize those farm products um, and donate them to say a food bank or something along those lines. Uh, those are just a few examples or a couple examples of an organization that may qualify for 501c3 um, status. And we'll talk about kind of the avenues to do that in a second. Um, but there are numerous other organizations that actually may qualify for 501c3 and also be an ag co-op. <clears throat> you can see my voice is starting to crack here. Was not expecting that because I, I am just getting back, uh, like I said, and typically I could talk for hours without any of that happening. Um, Okay, so let's talk about the second most common or the most common type of non or not nonprofit of uh, agricultural cooperatives. And those are the ones that are outlined in subchapter T of the Eternal Revenue Code. And these are all uh, 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 for profit agricultural cooperatives, right? The typical kind of um, way that you would think an uh, um, agricultural cooperative would be taxed. Um, uh, well, oh, I skipped one. Um, so to kind of backtrack real quick, <clears throat> if your organization is a for-profit agricultural cooperative, there are a few options in which uh, your organization can be taxed. The first is not the subchapter C. The first is actually be taxed as a typical corporation uh, where you pay taxation at the corporate level. Um, and then whenever you issue dividends to your patrons or members, they will pay taxes on their personal income taxation. Uh, this is uncommon, however, um, more likely uh, the IRS, or you would want to be taxed as a subchapter T. The IRS recognizes the purpose of the cooperative, so they kind of built into the Internal Revenue Code an avenue that benefits the cooperative mo model and encourages um, organizations to actually <clears throat> uh, form as cooperative. Uh, cooperative. Um, under subchapter T, cooperatives are not subject to that double taxation, like I mentioned for corporations. Uh, they are only taxed once at either the patron level or the co-op level. Uh, it's more typical that it will be taxed at the patron level. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, they do this by permit, permitting patronage distributions or patronage refunds uh, to the members to be deducted from the overall gross income of the cooperative. Uh, there are intricate ways that this can be done. Uh, most patrons typically, and additionally, most cooperatives and patrons and patrons typically allow for cooperatives to retain some of the patronage um, for the cooperative to grow or cover protection um, or use a protection to cover uh, future losses. Um, and, you know, depending on the way that your organization is structured, the way your organization is set up, what's outlined in membership agreements, um, uh, uh, this may or may not be taxed uh, by a patron or a cooperative level. Finally, it's always good to mention the, the very intricate ones. Um, certain farmers cooperatives could qualify for additional deductions under Section 521 of the Internal Revenue Code, um, such as deductions on dividends and stock and other patron non patronage income. Uh, however, this is very strict. Uh, there, this is essentially pretty rare for cooperatives to qualify for. And if you do think that you qualify for a Section 521 uh, the cooperative, 
um, definitely reach out to an attorney or an accountant to get confirmation before you go that avenue, because by the time that you um, end up paying taxes, you know, you're going to be, uh, or get audited, you'll be, you'll be hit pretty hard. Um, and, and additionally, all three of these could take up a, a whole presentation. So um, make sure that if, if you are, you know, interested in forming a cooperative or, you know, you're, um, there's a lot of educators here, you know, you're going to teach a class or something like that. Make sure you speak to a tax specialist or an attorney uh, to get the necessary information, because if you've ever read the Internal Revenue Code, it is extremely confusing and uh, very long. So I, I, quick side note, whenever I was my first, second year of law school, I had uh, uh, taxation, business taxation, and the first day of law school, um, the professor came in with the tax code. And it was about 20 massive books that she stacked on her desk and said, uh, we're not going to get through this this semester. <laughs> and by the end of law school, uh, there was a new president and it all changed. So that was, uh, that was interesting. But any questions about any of that before I move on to some of the formation kind of stuff? Go ahead. Hey, John, when you were talking about the subchapter uh, T, would that be like profit sharing? What like exactly? A, would that be like a business with profit sharing? No. So, well, I don't know what you mean by profit sharing exactly. Um, the, cooperatives uh, the, inherently are profit sharing organizations, right? Um so yes, to answer your question, that would be essentially profit sharing. I, when I hear words like that, um, as far as just kind of the legal uh, words in my mind, but I think what you're asking is whether or not this is kind of the traditional cooperative model uh, for profit sharing, like patronage and, and, and yes, right. that, exactly. Um, okay, that kind of what, I'm used, to, kind of what I'm used to with uh, cooperatives is, you know, you go out west and you got the people that are going to buy all of your corn. So you're going to sell it to that co-op for a certain amount. And then that co-op's going to go and sell your corn, you know, on the national prospect of it. And then at the end, uh, if there's a certain above a profit, you know, from that co-op that's made, they do profit sharing with everybody that contributed, you know, that are members of that co-op. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And, and, and what subchapter T does allows for that contribution, right, to be deducted from the gross income of the overall cooperative. Okay. Right. Thank you. So instead of in a typical corporation model, uh, the corporation is paying taxes on everything and then issuing dividends. Okay. And those dividends are then taxed again. Subchapter T allows for that cooperative to deduct those essentially dividends to um, the patrons, uh, okay. reducing the overall tax um, liability for the company and allowing the cooperative to grow and prosper a lot easier than say in the corporation model because they're not bogged down by all of those double taxation issues. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, sir, thank you. Well, there's a bunch of chats here. Those, uh, many of those chats are just sharing resources where folks can learn more about some of the stuff you've mentioned. And I think actually you've answered the ones that are questions in there. Yeah, I see I see the only natural person. Yeah. Um, that is actually not defined in the, um, in the, the formation section of the, the code. Uh, natural persons comes from, ooh, the provision, I, I wanna, don't want to, to cite it, um, while I'm being recorded, <laughs> because I could be wrong. Um, but that comes from the provision that is referring to the actual filing, right? So um, uh, if you are looking at the code, and that was my first instinct too, whenever I was uh, discussing um, or looking at whether or not an organization could be a um, individual that forms a cooperative, uh, uh, I was looking all throughout the code and natural persons only in my um, research only appeared in the file uh, and it was referring to an authorized representative. So I don't know if that's what that meant right there. So. And, and you'll see a lot of the times lawyers answer questions with it depends uh, because we don't like to, to give firm answers. So 
it depends. Um, all right, awesome. Make sure I'm not missing anything else. All right. Oh no, I backtracked somehow. We have to see my good animation, animation again. Why is this not moving? I think my computer is frozen. Has anything changed on your side? Oh, there we go. I wasn't hitting it hard enough. Okay. Um, let me look at my time here. Oh, gosh. Um, so now that we've discussed what, what is needed from the cooperative, let's discuss actually how to register. And I just realized that I only have four minutes, technically, from what you told me to, to plan for. Um, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm going to try to <laughs> get as much stuff uh, in as possible. So you, I will kind of move quicker. Um, this is how you actually register. These are the, the, the most important links uh, in West Virginia. Um, I wanted to kind of bring up some of this stuff, specifically this one. Skip verification. Can you guys see this? Is that up? No, is it still the PDF? Still the slide for okay. us. Here. Now is it good? Yep. Yep. Now it's the form. Um, so the first link I want to show you is the paper version of the Articles of Incorporation for an Agricultural Cooperative um, in West Virginia. Think of the Articles of Incorporation as like essentially the birth certificate of the company. Uh, the reg registration cost for this is $100. Um, Basically, this form discusses everything that we uh, outlined in the, the initial formation statute, right? Um, but a couple of things I do want to touch on here. So first is the name. When you are forming an agricultural cooperative, I highly recommend the first thing you do is research whether or not your name is available. Um, you are not allowed to form a, a company that has the same name as another company, even if it's a different entity type, right? So if it's uh, Farmer John's uh, Cooperative and there's a Farmer John's uh, Corporation, uh, you're not going to be able to form, right? And I get a lot of, uh, I've had plenty of clients come in and, you know, they're all ready to go. And I tell them, you can't form with that thing. And they've already spent a lot of money on marketing and stuff along those lines. Uh, just make sure that you do uh, research, research that name. Um, availability, as well as uh, make sure that you look at um, or make sure that you're including the appropriate ending uh, when you do fill out these documents, um, such as cooperative or co-op. Um, then when you're doing this, uh, you can see that it's going to ask you for all your address, mailing address, uh, uh, physical address, etc. One thing I do want to point out here is the name and the address of the person or agent to whom notice of process may be sent. This is uh, your registered agent. This person is the person who will receive service process on behalf of the company um, or be sued uh, on behalf of the company or receive that lawsuit. Uh, it has to be a person physically located in West Virginia. Um, there are organizations that uh, you can pay a nominal fee annually to be set up as your registered agent in West Virginia. Um, but if, because, you know, I'm talking to Ohio, I really do want to point that out, that if you are uh, going to be forming one in West Virginia or coming here, you will need to uh, find somebody to act as the registered agent in the state. Hey, John, um, just to clarify, um, can you can you clarify? So what you're talking about there is is an individual who can accept notice, essentially. Um, and, you know, sometimes questions that we see are related to the liability of members in a cooperative uh, for actions or debts or other liabilities of the co-op. Can you clarify what that limitation of liability looks like? For the registered agent or just in general? In general, for members of a co-op. Yeah, so, it, well, it, it's really set, structured, as you want it. Um, so basically in a cooperative, the, the typical mo model is that the cooperative in itself, the board of directors, the members will have a limited liability um, 
for actions of the cooperative or business conducted by the cooperative. Uh, now, what do I mean by limited liability? Um, if I was a sole proprietor, if I was just Farmer John and I'm out selling my product to um, uh, Stacy and Stacy gets sick, Stacy can sue me uh, uh, not only for um, whatever my operations are, the money that I made from selling my product, but also uh, for my car, my home, any personal assets I have. In a general cooperative model, that liability is limited um, for the activities of business. So if Stacy does get sick for something the cooperative sells, um, then you will not be liable for your personal assets. You won't be liable for the business that is conducted within the cooperative. Now, there are caveats to that, um, uh, specifically <laughs> fraud or anything along those lines that kind of breach that. It's called breaching the corporate veil. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a high burden to prove, um, but it does happen. If you knew about it, if it's sketchy and it, it doesn't sound right, then it's likely that you could be, that corporate veil could be breached. Um, now, there is also another thing that I would do want to mention. Insurance is amazing. <laughs> um, make sure that you do get business liability insurance regardless uh, of that kind of limited liability aspect in, uh, that, that, that comes with the cooperative model, model. That way you do have that kind of double protection. And then also make sure that you are following all the rules and regulations, set your company up legally, have everything, and then operate as you are a cooperative, right? So if you are part of the cooperative and you're Farmer John's cooperative, don't go around saying I'm Farmer John right say you are dealing business with farmer john's cooperative because that could be another way that uh, uh, an individual could breach that kind of corporate liability that comes with cooperative. does that answer your question hannah yeah it does thanks yeah. all right so also um there are some certain things like email address website that they ask for uh not necessarily required in order for formation um, but the number eight, I do want to point out, uh, does the, the distinction of nonprofit, non-stock um, versus for-profit. And uh, I'll bring up the nonprofit, non-stock little uh, section that is included in a minute. Um, however, if you are for-profit, the articles will require you to list uh, the capital stock that you want to authorize and at what far value. Um, I've done gone off track with my notes, so I'm just going to wing it here. Um, so capital stock is the amount of um, stock that is in the co uh, cooperative. I will say that um, all that is required here is uh, the amount that you are authorized, not the amount that you are issuing. So there's a big distinction, right? So the amount that you authorize um, is the total amount of capital stock that is available to uh, the cooperative to sell at some point later in the future. This can be amended rather easily. Um, however, you know, you don't want to do that every time that you bring members, in, right? So what I usually do is recommend, uh, what I usually recommend is to um, authorize an extremely high amount of capital stock at the beginning, uh, maybe 500,000 or a million shares of capital stock. And we'll talk about distinctions possibly if we get to it, of the different types of capital stock. Um, but you'll be uh, listing at what par value. Par value is just the minimum amount that a capital stock or that a stock could be sold for. Um, it doesn't, it's not the valuation of how much it's worth, right? Stock is valued at whatever anybody is willing to pay for it. Um, the par value is the minimum. So Whenever you are forming a cooperative or advising people about cooperatives, I highly recommend that you do a very high authorized amount of shares and a very low par value so the founders don't have to you know, pay a lot out of pocket to purchase that, that cooperative uh, or cooperative stock. Um, so typically what I'll do is like 500,000 shares at a par value of a fraction of a penny, and that will allow you to manipulate the stock valuation moving forward as you grow. Um, any questions about stock? I know it's a very uh, quick rundown of what they're asking here. Um, but yes. 
So the purpose, just like I said, it has to qualify in those agricultural products um, uh, and agricultural uh, purposes. Uh, but yeah, pretty straightforward. You're not, you're probably not going to be a scrap metal dealer. Um, for nonprofits, going to ask you if you have no member members. Uh, this is where it discusses the incorporators. Like I said, you need three individuals, um, natural persons. Uh, uh, one can be an authorized representative, uh, or they could all be authorized representatives of the company. I do want to touch real quick on this fee waiver. Um, if it is a veteran-owned cooperative in West Virginia, which means control owned by at least 51% uh, uh, one or more veterans, this fee can be waived. Um, additionally, there is something called the Young Entrepreneurship Act in West Virginia that allows this fee to be waived for incorporators who are between the ages of 18 and 30. You just have to show proof of residency as, as well as um, um, age, right? So, and that doesn't mean that everybody has to be from West Virginia. If you have one person from West Virginia, then uh, you would qualify. That meets those age requirements. But yeah, so that's the articles. Let me exit out of this. Go back to the sharing. Right. Can you see this one now? Okay, so this is the articles, the nonprofit attachment. Uh, the only thing different about this is the nonprofit attachment. Um, and that's what this is. So West Virginia has put together um, uh, language for any organization that does want to obtain 501c3 status that meets those requirements. Uh, this will um, meet those requirements for the organizational test of a 501c3. Uh, so real quick, one couple of things that I do want to note here um, is that you're going to be organized exclusively for, like I said, one of those qualifying purposes, as well as um, uh, meets certain limitations, such as uh, giving all of your money to another 501c3 fund dissolution, or not engaging in any um, uh, political activity, such as, uh, 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 in, such as promoting certain political campaigns or things along those lines. That doesn't necessarily mean lobbying, however. So, uh, just remember that there is a distinction between political campaigning and lobbying. Um, let's see here. Another one that I want to bring up since we are here is the out of state business registration certificate, right? So if you are formed in Ohio already um, and you want to operate in West Virginia, you're going to have to complete this form. It's a little bit uh, uh, more costly for a nonprofit, but um, like I said, those fee waivers still exist. Uh, but it will ask you certain questions like, where are you from? Where's your home state? Um, uh, where's your principal office? How do we sue you? Do you have a registration? agent? All that kind of good stuff. But just remember that it's not as simple as just forming another company, or not as simple as just operating in West Virginia. You do have to complete the, the required documents, um, <clears throat> as well as state tax registration. I will be bringing up in just a second. Any questions about that out-of-state business registration before I move on? Um, now, the good thing about West Virginia, uh, which I kind of hate as an educator, is that they moved everything to online, essentially, um, and you can just do these online, you can just do this application online. Uh, it's relatively quick. Um, it's on the businessforwestvirginia.gov portal, uh, uh, but you can just go here and you can complete it. So a click box, fill in the blank, and it will take you through all of those paper forms. Uh, and it will also set you up an account with the Secretary of State's office, so you will be able to um, pay your annual uh, registration fee, um, and so on and so forth. All right. So, John, we have a question in the chat about um, what it what you mean by or what it means to operate in West Virginia. When yeah, is so it that um, a, a, an out of state co op might need to file as operating in West Virginia? So this is actually uh, this is actually a debatable topic. What operating West Virginia essentially means. Um, the idea behind it is principal uh, place of business, right? Or a um, physical place of business is an easier way to think of it, I guess. Um, and it's actually debatable because of Amazon, right? Amazon was a big one of whether or not they operate, whether or not they should be paying taxes if they are just selling to an area. 
Um, typically, no. If you're just selling to an area, you are not um, technically operating in that state uh, for the purposes of uh, these forms. However, if you do have a location, if you do have a farmland, if you are selling, if you have a partner that's in this, that's a major contributor to what you are uh, providing, the state would likely want you to register just so they have that ability to find you in the event that they need to find you, right? Um, but the, the, I think the real question here is whether or not just selling to West Virginia qualifies as operating. And that's again, debatable, <laughs> um, but uh, if most of your products are being sold to West Virginia, that's where you're kind of on the line of whether or not you are operating in the state. And the follow-up question to that is whether there are tax implications to, I, I guess- um, Sales and use question? tax, probably. Okay. Um, yeah, so essentially if you are selling in the state, um, in West Virginia, not only would you have to pay whatever income tax uh, the state would require from your cooperative, if you don't obtain that exemption or as your patron, um, but also sales and use tax would, would qualify for sure um, in the state. You would have to collect that from your uh, uh, distributors or however, um, and then pay that to the state. I do recommend that um, if you are confused about it, don't just uh, ignore it. Uh, go to an account and make sure that you are uh, getting everything done because if uh, in the event you do get audited and this kind of stuff comes out, um, the penalties can be very high and they could, you know, um, collapse a small cooperative. So just make sure that if you have any concerns about it, that you go reach out to either myself or another attorney or a, a tax specialist just to kind of get clarification um, specifically to what you are confused about. That's a good point, John, and a question that I was hoping um, in the last couple of minutes here you could share some perspective on is, you know, there are there are a lot of considerations in the startup process for a co-op um, and any small business, really. So when in that process do you recommend that cooperative entrepreneurs prepare to meet and work with an attorney? And, you know, as an attorney, is it helpful for you if the if those entrepreneurs already have certain questions answered or uh, certain things like a business plan prepared like what is that how do you how can entrepreneurs help you as an attorney help them yeah so you got to think about it as a little uh, twofold right so like you said mentioned Hannah uh, business plan being prepared that is one um, now business plans are working documents uh, so you can modify them at any time uh, but it, I don't recommend speaking to an attorney if you just have the idea right um, like I said, I'm the only free legal clinic. We are the only free legal clinic in West Virginia. They're, they're far and few between. Uh, if you want to pay $1,000 to an attorney to basically do nothing at the beginning of your operations, you can do that. Um, but I don't recommend immediately speaking to an attorney. I recommend figuring out whether or not your idea is even viable. Um, uh, so yes, first step I would recommend is developing a business plan. And when you are for sure committed to that process before purchasing any land or entering into any contracts with anybody, that's the point when I would recommend reaching out to an attorney. Um, that process can be lengthy, right? So I don't recommend specific, like going and just immediately registering your business on the Secretary of State's website. If you are at that point, you have then already developed a business plan. Um, so if you're about to register your business on the Secretary of State's website, you may want to consult with an attorney prior to doing so. Not necessarily the case that you need to um, pay an attorney to do it, uh, depending on the size of your organization, but it's always better, in my opinion, to have an attorney complete this kind of legal formation process for you to make sure everything is structured correctly um, for your organization to move forward, right? Uh, specifically when it comes to taxation, like we mentioned with the 501c3, the 521, the subchapter T's, uh, that your entity is set up correctly in order to um, best uh, uh, best operate successfully. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you talked a little bit at the start about uh, what the clinic does. Um, I'm hoping in the next couple of minutes, uh, we're going to have to wrap up here in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but could you talk a little bit about how entrepreneurs can connect with the clinic and what the process of working with the clinic looks like? And yeah, then, so so real quick, Hannah, let me bring back my sure. screen. Yeah, and real, just because I have it here, this is the state tax registration. Um, this is a $30 fee. This will also need to be completed as well uh, when you uh, are forming the organization. Is the screen back? Not yet. We still are just seeing okay. the form. New, oh, new share, new share. New share. Mm -hmm. I will get this eventually. Um, yep, we now we see, now we see your slides. Yeah, there's absolutely no way I'm getting all that. There we go. Since, yes, I told you I could talk for hours, Hannah. Um, there's <laughs> a lot to talk about with co-ops, so we get it. I didn't even, I, I'm not even halfway through the presentation. I know I only have three slides left, but <laughs> uh, I was, I was thinking about that. I was like 40 minutes. I wonder if it's going to be 40 minutes. Um, yeah. Okay, so if you want to contact us, this is our website. We've made a um, we made it very super, like very easy for you to apply. Uh, just uh, go to our website. If you go to information for clients, um, it's all electronic, and you can submit all of your information and, and your legal questions uh, to our clinic. We are currently at capacity, um, but we are accepting new clients for the upcoming semester that the students will be having, um, or the upcoming spring semester. So that will be around January. Um, additionally, I have my contact information uh, here. Um, if you have any questions about the application, feel free to give me a call, shoot me an email. Um, email is usually best. Uh, I, I, I am in the office as much as possible, but I'm constantly running around in meetings. So, uh, and I try to reply to emails as quickly as possible. Uh, last two weeks have been kind of terrible though <laughs> on emails. I have a massive backlog of emails. But um, um, some of the things that we do require of you um, before you do apply, as Hannah uh, kind of alluded to, is the business plan. Please have a business plan developed. Um, additionally, your organization has to be uh, either going to be headquartered in West Virginia or um, significantly operating in West Virginia. So if you have a question about operating in West Virginia, reach out. I'll let you know <laughs> before you can apply. Um, and uh, uh, like I said, we, we will represent you in any transactional matter that has to do with your organization, that, whether that be development of your bylaws, membership agreements, um, internal uh, policies, such as record retention policies, non-disclosures, all that kind of good stuff, uh, as well as any of the, the filing requirements with the Secretary of State's office, State Tax Department, all that kind of good stuff. Um, we are a free legal clinic. Our services are free. The only thing that we do not cover is any filing fees. So if you are trying to be a 501c3, that's the big one. Um, you may have to fit the bill for the filing fee with the IRS, which could be either like $275, I believe, for the EC or $600 for the application. Um, but we'll let you know what the potential costs of those services are well before uh, they pop up. Um, I think that covers everything about my clinic. Any other questions now that we kind of are at the end? I don't want to keep anyone much longer. Um, than they've allotted. Yeah, so if there are questions for John, feel free to to those in the chat. Um, if I'm going to just share a couple of other uh, pieces of information, uh, while if you have another question, feel free to put that in the chat. So um, did just want to mention that if you are interested in learning more about cooperatives, if you're working to build co a cooperative or a collaborative business, or you are an educator who supports co-op enterprises or would like to support co-op enterprises, we'd like to invite you to a couple of events that we're hosting in October. So um, as a part of the Appalachia Cooperates Initiative, we are having a a uh, program called Unleash Potential with Cooperative Management Practices. We'll have an organizational effectiveness consultant who's going to address how the co-op principle of voluntary and open membership can actually become an advantage uh, for a team. So participants are going to leave with a set of tools to discover the skills that exist in the organization and invite team members to contribute in new ways. So as we're thinking about how to embody and live those co-op principles, uh, we're excited about that opportunity to learn about uh, cooperative management practices.
And then as a part of the Appalachia Cooperates Initiative, we also host a monthly informal peer networking calls. These are opportunities where uh, we come together, save some space for about an hour a month where we're together on Zoom, uh, cooperative, community, business, economic developers across the region can join to just connect with other people, learn who else is working in this space, share projects that they might be working on or discuss best practices or even ask questions uh, or learn about resources. So um, we encourage you, we do host those monthly. The one for October is on October 20th from 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, both of those events actually are no cost, but you will need to register to receive the Zoom connection details. And you can do that at the links that are shared on the screen, or we'll also put those in the chat box as well. Uh, so feel free to um, uh, register for those, or if you um, want to ask questions or get more information, feel free to reach out to my colleague Samantha Black about those as well. And then finally, uh, the fact that you're here hopefully means that you receive emails from us. Um, if you don't receive emails from us, we uh, invite you to join our email list to get details about events, get news from our center, uh, and more. So you can self-subscribe using the link there on the screen or also the link in the chat. So do feel free to uh, connect with us in multiple ways. We uh, want to understand how we can support the cooperative community, and uh, part of that comes from connecting with folks. And here's our connection information. Uh, so feel free to get in touch with us uh, if we can answer questions or just brainstorm ideas or help connect you with uh, other resources. And so finally, we did mention that uh, we recorded this session. It's going to be made available online and we'll share that when it becomes available online, we'll share that via email. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for that, but do please give us a little bit of time because we do have to process that recording and get it posted. Um, and as we mentioned, your feedback really helps us improve future learning sessions. So uh, please do take a few minutes to complete the, the brief survey that you'll find actually when you close out of the Zoom application today. Um, we, we take that into consideration when we're thinking about future programming uh, and reporting on our programming as well. Um, so uh, you'll also receive a follow-up email with the evaluation, the recording, and John's contact information and slides if you want to learn more. So let me just check the chat. I know we're over by just a couple minutes, but if you have any last-minute questions, feel free. And uh, otherwise, thanks so much for joining, and we hope to see you in future sessions or somewhere around the co-op community. Thank you, Anna. Thank you.